we just did the tour of St. Nicholas Abbey, which was fabulous. Uh, St. Nicholas Abbey is right back there, and we are waiting on the far side. So if you ever want to go here, I'm going to show you this track right here. The ZR bus, which is the first time we rode, pops off the road, and it will drop you right here on this nondescript trail that looks like a trail to nowhere that perhaps you hear Deliverance playing on. But no, you actually just walk right down there, you go through there, there's a gate that says, uh, do not cross, dogs are there, cross that gate, that's a total lie. And then you just go right into the Abbey, and uh, how much was the tour? For $15 a person US, you get the tour of the Abbey, some sampling of some rum, which I've had. I actually had some extra rum, so that's good. Yeah, but so it's, it's thirty dollars. Thirty dollars U.S. Oh, it's sixty Barbados. Thirty dollars U.S. And they give you some rum. They tour you tour the whole place. And the name of the place? Saint Nicholas. Nicholas Abbey is actually not an abbey at all. It is a essentially a rum distillery. They they pick their own rum from all these fields you can see right there. Sorry, they pick their own sugar cane from all these fields right there. They crush it in a steam crusher and then they make the rum from it and they show the whole process. What you'll see tonight on the video is you'll see I did the I recorded the entire tour. So you get to see all that. You get to see how they make the rum, how they distill it, how they actually crush the uh, sugar cane, everything. So we are waiting for our ZR bus right now. Yeah, I'll show you, kind of show you where we're at. Give you a little view. So this is the road we're on. This road is just in the middle of nowhere. You have no idea that there's ever gonna be anything here. We're trusting the locals like we've been doing, which by the way, the Barbadian locals are the friendliest people I've ever seen. And they, they will scare you wrong. So I will see you guys later if I get back from this abbey. If not, this might be my last broadcast. Anyway, bye. We are on the road to Nicholas Abbey and we have just encountered some guinea hens. Haven't seen anything like this in Barbados yet. So we just took a harrowing ZR van ride and the ZR van is about a 14 person VW bus, <laughs> which goes like a bat out of hell to get you wherever you wanna go in Barbados for $2. On, on, the, on some of the smallest roads known to man. All of it we could have considered sketchy, but I didn't actually feel endangered at all. It was actually really fun. So, everybody, the guinea set can say hi. Hey, Dante, guinea hands for you. Beautiful here.
check if you take a look up here and take a look at the machine rig. That's cool. Now, what about money? Yeah. Put the key in three minutes. Raise it up. And that is a steam He's cleaning up. He's cleaning up all the fruit there. He's bashful. Is he? Yeah. Okay, well I'll stop bugging him. I thought he was going for the fruit. What? I thought he was going for the fruit. process into rum. Oh, oh rum? We made rum here. Oh, okay. Gotcha. We made the best rum here ever said. Well, we have to go try some. <laughs> right? Where you do the uh, home store, okay. you give a sample of it. Excellent. Oh, nice. yeah. Excellent. Thank you very Thank much. You. But we'll be starting back at 150 and you can come back. Okay. Thank you. The, the Melfield, this thing, uh, you saw this pressing or? Yeah. Okay, because they, they have low steam pressure at the moment. Um, apparently the, the material to feed the boiler got wet yesterday. Uh -huh. yeah, so this is our small distillery here. And from this distillery we produce some award winning rum so far. Um, what we do here, we take the sugarcane juice and concentrate it into a syrup. That is when we crush the sugarcane with the old semen. That's 127 years old. And once we concentrate that into a syrup, we can then store that syrup. And after the sugarcane season, we can then have supply where we can continue to do fermentation and then distillation of rum. And by fermentation, we take that sugarcane syrup, dilute it with water, and we add yeast. The yeast converts sugar into alcohol. So you get what we then call sugar wine. If you look here, you'll see it boiling. Uh, you boil it on sugar wine. Yeah. And this, the smell that you are smelling now is actually the parks. Now, time and temperature. You can separate the compounds and those compounds if you look on the board heads hearts and tails those are the compounds that were created during the fermentation process so during the fermentation process you have the creation of the compounds which make up the alcohol structure but the only drinkable one is called the hearts so the hearts the heads hearts and tails are separated during this process so you have heat in here you have the vapors of alcohol compounds right you know rising the column condense into a liquid because we control the column and returning and that returning or reflux action you can see going on here is what separates the compounds so the compounds of heads were taken earlier on this morning they were the first to boil they have the lower boiling point and they come out of the mixture through the system this is a compound distillation or fractionated column so you have the separation of the compounds going on all the while you're distilling the heads was taken this morning it goes to the heads container and now the hearts is flowing. After the hearts, you'll get tails, and the tails will be separated during that process as well. So you have heads, hearts, and tails, and that is the, the compounds that make up the alcohol structure. The only drinkable compounds is called the hearts. That's the intoxicating agent. That is all it does.
So you have that coming off the distillery about 92%, 184 proof. And from that, it goes to the barrels, slightly diluted to 65%, and it's aged. The aging process goes on in the barrels alone, not in the bottle. So you can have the barrels aged for after about 20, maybe 30 years. And the aging process allows the high level alcohol to be removed or escape to the size of the barrel, leaving a mellow alcohol behind. So you have that smoothness in the rum. Now this is the small award winning distillery. Um, UK Rum Fest 2012, we won Gold Barrel Award. Um, 2013, Silver, Hong Kong Silver France. 2015, 2016, Bartenders of the Year Award. Best boutique white rum for mixing of rum punches and cocktails. So this is our distillery, Annabelle. Any questions? What are the barrels made of? The barrels are made of oak, and it's the white oak that are, is used in the rum industry. And they, they, they can be used many times, because these barrels were used in Kentucky before, they had bourbon in them, oh. and you have the barrels being used once in the US. They cannot be reused, so they ship them to rum producers, who then use those barrels to age their rum. So you get a, a, a mixture of flavors, which give you, you know, the competitive edge when you do that. Yeah. Yes. So the white rum, is that just white rum, is that how it spells off and it becomes brown by the tea no. in the barrel? When we do the distilling, the rum, the alcohol comes off crystal clear. So it goes to the still at the time and it's kept there until it's ready to be used or sold. And the aging process actually gives the white rum its colour when you place it in the barrel. So the colour comes from the barrel. Also some of the flavours come from the barrel as well. Then you have things like blending, where you can do adding things like caramel. Um, you can mix younger age rum with older age rum to get different flavors, you know, things like that. What about it's 78 it's Why is it a... No, that's, 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 that barrel is turned upside down. It's, it's turned upside down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the, um, the numbers, it says 78% because it boils up, but the actual temperature... Oh, oh, okay. The, the, that's the temperature of the gauge you're talking about? Yes. That's the Celsius. Now, this kettle will be actually hotter than the cup. Right. In order to get those vapors to rise to the highest point, oh, you have a, you to use water. a higher temperature here. Yeah. So the temperature here will always be higher. But the, the electronic gauge is the highest gauge, and that reads now 77.1. Yeah. Okay, okay, Heads boils at between 60 to 77 degrees Celsius. So the heads are all out. Yeah. So now you have parts flowing. So 71, 77 up to 78, 79, 80, you get parts flowing. And the ones that are the heads and the tails, are they poisonous? Yes, you have acetone, <laughs> fingernail polish remover. Yeah. So do you, so use, methanol, do you sell that to people? No, um, yeah, th what the large distillery will do, they will ship that out of the island. Yeah. And yeah. you have comp um, factories that make fingernail polish remover antifreeze for the radiator, yeah. methanol. Yeah. And then you have other compounds that are usable to make other products. Yeah. Yeah. So th those are, we, what we do here is a small amount of recycling. We take those back to the, to the distillery here mm -hmm. and make sure that we have all of the hops. And that is the rest of the waste is then mixed, it is then mixed with the waste from this waste here and it goes to the field as a fertilizer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. so, when, so when you first make it, is it clear? And then it's is it age it? The aging process gives it color. So why, so how is it different? So when you sell it when it's clear, uh -huh. how is it aged up to when it's clean? Um, it's, it's a young rum. It is not aged, it's not smooth. It will be harsh. So, oh, and, so it's not that nice to drink. Yeah, well, a professional drinker will drink it. But it's mainly, it's mainly used, it, or it could be used mainly for rum punches and cocktails. Yeah, but not If you do a rum punch, you will have that rum coming out of the mixture. But if you use the age rum that has been aged for maybe 12 or 18 years, you, you, don't, you don't get that flavor coming through, that rum flavor coming through. So the, the cocktail mixes are mainly used with young rum. Colonel Benjamin Berger. Now he was one of the first early English settlers that we had here on the island. We were settled by the British in 1627. By the year 1634, Benjamin was here. He decided this is the spot he wanted to build a house and he had the house completed by 1658. Now the house is one out of three Jacobin styled mansions found in the Western Hemisphere and Barbados is actually home to two of them. 
Now it's built flat to the ground, so there's no foundation or elevation whatsoever. As you may have realized, you walk straight in from outside, no steps. The floors here are also made of North American pitch pine, and they were last changed back in 1910. So they are well over 100 years old, and usually they would have been changed every 100 years. Now walls of the house are also original. The walls are three feet thick. They were made from rubble, stone, and clay. And these are the original walls of the house. Now the house is also built facing the northeast as well, and that's to capture the trade winds. So from time to time, you get a very cool breeze coming on through. So you can have a look into the dining room and I'll tell you a bit about the pieces that you see there. So you can have a peek on the inside. So just off to the left, that's our second oldest piece of furniture, the 1780 English Sheraton sideboard. Dining room table and chairs are all made of Armenian mahogany. They date back to the 18th century and they were made right here on the sugar plantation. Now the table is also laid out with the English coal port china as well and those were all hand painted back in England in 1810. The inspiration for those pieces came from a piece of Japanese silk, so they are an Amari design. It's a 72 piece set and they're not just one piece, okay? <laughs> so we don't do tasting with the 18. So perhaps if you want to have a taste of that one, you're going to purchase a bottle, and then of course make sure that we all have a taste. <laughs> now into the cabinet here, we've also got some white wood china. Pattern to the top goes back to the 1800s, and the blonde white one down to the bottom, definitely a more recent one. That one is known as the willow pattern. Now just up to the top as well, there's a shell vase. And most of the shell work here in the house would have been done between the 1830s and 1880s by the native craft ladies here in Barbados. All made of shells taken up off the island's beaches. That's the natural color of the shells, and sadly we don't see much of those anymore, but that's the shell vase. Now we've also got some stuffed birds just over here as well, and they're actual stuffed birds. And they are all said to be native birds, but to be quite honest, we really don't recognize a whole lot of them. All the larger birds here, we've never seen before. We recognize about three or four of the smaller ones. This one right here, that's the hummingbird, which we still do see. That's the sparrow, and the long beat one here is the pea whittler. And these stuffed birds are over 150 years old. So that's the stuffed birds. Now there's also another shell piece coming up here as well. This one is known as the sailor's valentine. Comes in a mahogany lot basket, which makes it safe for travel. Now we got the name the sailor's valentine because in the olden days, Anything with a heart shape, the sailors would have bought, and they took it back home for their wives, sweethearts, and girlfriends, and claimed that they made them. Hence the name, the Sailor's Valentine. And ladies, we know that's a typical man for you, right? <laughs> and the sailors would have been telling a whole lot of stories back then because they really had a sweetheart in every port, so they were buying them by the dozen. That's the Sailor's Valentine. Now the porch where you enter, that is not original to the house. That was added in 1746, and the windows were also changed as well in that same year, from the push-out to the current sash windows. So straight ahead and through these two windows, that's our herb garden on the outside, laid out for a traditional English style. In the olden days, that would have been their medicine cabinet. We didn't have many doctors here on the island, so they would have found some type of herb or bush to use for medicinal purposes. So just ahead in the center, that's the bay leaf tree. So that's what bay leaf looks like before it is dried. Just behind that, there's some chives or seasoning blades, aloe vera, off to the far right, cilantro, parsley, lemongrass, wonder world. So we still do grow a number of herbs there. Most of them we utilize in our cafe. Now also all of this wooden paneling that you see here on the walls was implemented back in 1898. 
and by the year 1898, all the walls of the house were covered with moisture spots. Remember I said the house is built flat to the ground, so from time to time you had the moisture coming up and the walls used to get very, very damp and moldy. They're what you would have referred to as weeping walls. Now in 1898, we also had a bad hurricane here in Barbados. Lots of cedar trees on the property fell. So the owner at the time decided to utilize some of that cedar by implementing cedar paneling. So if you look up top, you will see that the walls are clean and nice, no moisture spots whatsoever. They're not damp, they're not moldy. Now we're really not sure what's going on behind here, but trust me, we really don't care to know. If it's not broken, you don't try to fix it, right? Come on into the study with me. before the old sugar plantation great house so this is where the plantation owner would have lived and this is how he would have lived okay now just off to the right of me we've got some early 19th century glassware all of which are actually gold plated down to the bottom there's also some gold plated 1850 mint in china as well so some very very old pieces just off to the left of me here ahead of you guys this is the center of attraction of this room i heard someone mention about the first lazy boy that's what lots of persons refer to this as but it's known as the gentleman's chair. Built back in England in 1936, and it cost just about 42 pounds. So in those days, that really was a lot of money. Now, as the name suggests, ladies, in the olden days, this chair was definitely not for us. Only for the gentleman, perfect height of luxury and relaxation for him. And the gentleman could do everything in this chair, really, except use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So this is how he got in. Oh. So once he was in, he was locked in and secure, definitely no getting out. Now the chair has a headrest and a footrest. It also has two headrests that can be pulled out as well. And if you press the button right here, back then the chair would have reclined into a very comfortable bed. Now we also had permanent bookmarks, and that's so if he was reading and fell asleep, he would not lose his page. Adjustable like for reading. Here he would use to read his newspaper, and that could be converted for the gentleman to use as a little table. So they basically thought about everything for the gentleman. Now just around this circle, he would place his cigar, his beverage, but most importantly, the gentleman always had a bell and that bell was to ring for service. So the gentleman was living by hotel still back in those days. But the chair is made on wheels and I always do tell the ladies those wheels were placed there just for us. And that's so perhaps if the gentleman rang the bell a bit too much for service, you could always wheel them away. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not going to wheel them next door. That's a bit too close. Off the nearest hill or off the nearest cliff. You've had just about enough, so it's time to get rid of the gentleman. So that's the gentleman's chair. Now over on this side, you can stay seated. We allow you to sit on any piece of furniture except the gentleman's chair. But this is another old chair, still quite safe to sit in. Made back in England in the early 1830s. It was all made out of mahogany. Carries the coat of arms of William IV, and it's known as the judge's chair. So that's the judge's chair. Now these four gentlemen that you see here on the walls, ancestors or connected to previous owners of the property, none of these gentlemen here actually own the property. And the property was owned by the Cave family for the longest period of time in history. They had the property from 1822 right down to 2006. In 2006, they sold to our present owner, Mr. Larry Warren. And that's him over there. He's the first Barbadian to ever own the property. Most of the previous owners would have been English and they would have been absentee owners in the olden days as well. Now it's just about 400 acres of land. When our present owner bought the house, he bought house, land, and contents. So all the pieces and the furniture you see here in the house really would have belonged to one family. That's the Cave family from Bristol, England, and the pieces are a collection of over five generations. So most of them are over 200 years old. Now just here on this little side table, we have Mr. Warren's only addition to the house. It's his 1952 Grandi, an old German radio, and it still does work. <laughs> So that's 
one of our local stations here on the island. You just plug it in on mornings for about five minutes or so, let it warm up, and then it works. So that's his old Grundy. Now, are any of you by chance familiar with that famous English actor known as Benedict Cumberbatch? Yep. Yeah. For those of you who are, just the head here is Mr. Abraham Cumberbatch. Now, I'm not sure if you can see the resemblance there, but he is the great, great, great grandfather of Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, now, at one point in time, he was also connected to the property. Two of his sons bought the property. It was later inherited by a granddaughter. Through that granddaughter is how the property got into the Cave family for five generations. They held on to it for a very long time. Now, ladies, in the olden days, if you were a woman and you had property, as long as you got married, you had to give the property over to the husband. So everything definitely was about the gentleman back then. They got the chair, they got the property, they got the land, and of course, they got the ladies. So the gentleman, they had everything. So as soon as she got married to a cave, she had to give the property over to the cave family. I always do say I don't know what kind of crazy law that was. And if I were alive back then, that would not have been my fate because I would have stayed single and kept my property. But lots and lots of husbands mysteriously died back then from natural causes, of course. When the ladies wanted the property back, there was only one way to do it, so they took care of them, and they took care of them very well. <laughs> Come on up with me. <laughs> not allowed to go on the upstairs and that is firstly because of this old staircase right here. Now it's a Chinese Chippendale staircase, features a different pattern on each flight of stairs so that pattern changes all the way up to the top. Now it's a 1746 staircase, well over 300 years old. It's very old and it's wooden, it cannot handle the traffic we have passing through on a daily basis. Now some days during the tourist season we have just about 300 to 400 persons passing through the house so the staircase really cannot handle that traffic. Now we are two floors up as well, and those floors are wooden floors. We have sagging in some areas. If you look up ahead into the living room, you will see some of that sagging. So for your safety, we don't allow you to go up. The insurance have not given us clearance. But upstairs, there are seven bedrooms, and they're all still fully furnished just as grand as the downstairs, so we really still do upkeep those bedrooms. There's four on the first landing, three on the second. There's also one bathroom addition as well, that came about in the 1930s. It's just through the hallway here and the doors are off to the left. So prior to the 1930s, it were the outhouses or bathhouses just on the outside. Now here on the wall, we have three pictures of three of the bedrooms upstairs for you guys to see. The first photo and the last one showcases the two bedrooms upstairs that actually carry fireplaces. And those are the two corner bedrooms on the first landing. Now those fireplaces have never ever been used since the house was built in 1658. We definitely don't need them for our climate. But do remember, it's a traditional English style house, and the house plans were done back in England. So I guess it's only fitting that it would carry the fireplaces, even if only for decoration. And who knows, maybe when the English built the house, they were a bit hopeful. We still are hopeful today, so perhaps there's no decides to fall. That's the reason for the fireplaces. Now, we still also do have the original lights, which is from 1920, and they still do work. So that's when they first had electricity here in the house. There's one just for you 1920 light switches. So we're just gonna head into the back area here. If you want, you can take a look at the photos and light switches. Then we're gonna go into the back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> gentlemen prior to that one bathroom addition that we have on the first landing which is just over us this door right here would have been the end of the house this back part addition only came about to facilitate that bathroom upstairs if you look down here you will see that the floors here are not made of North American pitch pine like the remainder of the house last door to the left here is also a bathroom facility as well and it has the original Thomas Crocker pole chain toilet in it and it's still in full use so if you've never seen one before, once it's unoccupied, you can't have a look at it. And now if someone tells you you're talking crap, well, you know where the word came from, okay? 
Now onto this side of the room. Once again, you can stay seated. It's quite safe. Yeah. That's our oldest piece of furniture in the house. The 1696 settle. It carries the date just in the center. And it was all hand carved. So lots of work went into that piece. And it was made out of oak. Just below where you would sit, if you lift up, there's some storage space there as well. So that's our oldest piece of furniture. Now just on this side of the room, we have an 1825 map of the island of Barbados. We are divided into 11 parishes. Here you see those parish boundaries laid out and they really have not changed much since 1825. Up to the top is our only female saint. She's called the St. Lucy. Then we have nine male saints. Down south there's Christ Church. Just in case you're wondering where we're at on the map, we're in the parish of St. Peter. St. Nicholas Abbey, that's us right there. Now just off the west coast of our capital, which is known as Bridgetown, there was once a small island that existed, known as Pelican Island, named after brown pelicans who nested there. Now it was also used to quarantine persons with contagious illnesses. That island has since been joined on to the mainland of our Bridgetown port. And it was joined on back in 1961. So now if you visit Barbados via cruise ship, that is where you would come in. Let's take it at the bottom as well. All of these names are plantations we had on the island back in 1825. So for over 300 years, sugarcane was our main industry. So we had lots of sugar plantations. Our sugarcane industry has drastically declined. That's no longer the case. Still our main crop, no longer our main industry. Tourism is now our main industry, so now we get to meet you beautiful people, and that's why you have to keep coming to Barbados, yeah? <laughs> now just on our hat wrap before we go on the outside, this brown hat here, this is known as the planter's hat. So this is the hat that the plantation owner would have worn. It was made out of cork, C-O-R-K, so it looks heavy, but it is indeed very light, it's featherweight, okay? So that's the planter's hat. Now at this point, I'm just gonna turn you over to Maureen, that's our operations manager. She's gonna take you guys from this point, okay? So there's rum to come, white rum, dark rum, and I just hope you guys can leave here walking straight today, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Now these were the two outhouses. She would have told you that the bathrooms were added in the 1930s. Yes, the bathrooms were added in the 1930s. Prior to that, they had to go to these two outhouses here. The funny part about the outhouses is that they would have four sections. You're gonna go inside, choose your side, have a conversation with the person next to you. Find out what he had for lunch. That is what it was like. You had to share it. But they have an interesting feature. They look very much like what the slave hut would have looked like. The only thing that the slave cup would have a lock finish looking like this, it would have a mud floor, a door like what it has, and a window with a push out stick like this one. It would have anything that they can throw on top of the roof, and they would be scattered around the plantation. Not in workable land, but oh, really, but they would have little pot that around them that they could plant a little bit of whatever they wanted to eat, like sweet potato, yam, okra, some of the foods that we Barbadians today love so much, okay? Now, these are actually some ballot sprigs. And these came over when the ships came over to collect the sugar. They would come with these ballots in the bottom and then they will go back up with sugar. Now you will see names like Bonnie Bridge, Calder, and all of those are the name of the brick houses they would have come from out of Scotland. If you look back here at the roof, you'll see that this gray catchment here, this bathrooms were added in the 1930s. They add that gray catchment to collect the water. And that water then in turn was used to flush the bathrooms. Today we don't use that water to flush the bathrooms. We actually have this, our normal running water and we use that for the bathrooms. But we actually use that water now, keep it into our watering tanks in case we have some fires around here threatening. So we know that we, we have to make sure we are all well prepared in case the, the fire comes and it threatens the house. This used tree here is called a sandbox tree or a monkey no climb. Now, it is filled with thorns, so you don't want to touch it. Normally when I say to the kids, please don't touch the tree, they don't touch the tree. But the adults touch the tree. That's the norm, all right? So eventually when I turn my back, one of you will touch the tree. I'm letting you know it has thorns, okay? At this point, this is where I start giving you some rum. So we're gonna start with the rum punch. And this is what your white rum has in. <laughs> and here's where we crush all the sugar cane. The house is right over here. We know that this is a next plantation because we see an old structure of the windmill there. These are all of our cane fields that are surrounded St. Nicholas Abbey. Over here we have the Cave family. Now the Cave family were the longest people to have the house. They had it between 1822 and 2006. 2006 they sold it to the present owner, Mr. Larry Warren, who's a Barbadian. 
This gentleman, Stephen, he's the person who really lived in the house. He died in 2003, okay? Now, right at the very top, you have Colonel Benjamin Barringer. He's the one who, bought the, who built the house. And he had his business partner, John Yeeman. Margaret Foster is his wife. I want you to retain those three names. Now here, Sir John Gay Allen. He owned the house at one point. He was the founder of Mount Gay Rum and the speaker of the house. It fell into debt around here. The chance recorder British Town owned it. And that's when the Comabatches bought it. Did you see Comabatch picture in the house? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the Comabatches there. Now Sarah Comabatch, she inherited it from her dad, Edward Carlton Comabatch. Now Sarah, got married at Bath Abbey, she was from St. Nicholas in Bristol. The plantation had already named St. Nicholas Plus. She combined the two names and that's how it got its name, St. Nicholas Abbey. But there are no mouths here. Charles K., this handsome dude here, that's who she got married to. They held on to it, the K. family, for six generations. The last of them, James Petrie, there's no picture of him there. When he, got, when he inherited the pro property after Stephen died, he sold it to the present owner, the Barbadians, the Warrens. Now every property has a juicy. St. Nicholas Abbey has one too. Now Colonel Benjamin Barringer come to Barbados with his 8,000 pounds. Now his business partner is John Meeman. But Benjamin is backward and forward, going up to England and leaving his wife down here with the business partner. How smart is he? <laughs> well, on one of his trips, he went up there for three years. Girls, three years. What was a girl supposed to do? <laughs> well, obviously she and the business partner was having an affair. So when he came back down, he and the wife had a big quarrel. The business partner joined with the wife and they arranged for him to go down and spikes down where they got him poisoned. And 10 weeks later, the two of them got married. Mm. But the law stated that once you got married, you had to give your man your property. Mm. But Margaret was very clever. And somehow, Margaret made sure, despite she had two other husbands after Yeman, she made sure that her property was given to her first, from the first son from the first husband. How did she manage to do that? Any suggestions? Poison. <laughs> she made sure the husbands died. Simple as that. Let's go to the <laughs> Now right here. Do you know what they paid for in two thousand What's that? Do you know what they paid for the current owner paid for the property in two thousand? No, I don't have a clue. <laughs> now here we have the slave records. Come on through so the others can come through. The slave records. Back then the British government felt it was time to get rid of slavery in the Caribbean, so they said to the rich planters, Now you list your assets. So they listed the assets. Zero zeros. It simply means that she's old and she cannot work. That's what I'm. On the other hand, you have William Boyce, who's 150 pounds. He's strong, he can do some manual work, and he would be of a high value. So what did some of them do? They took the money, and instead of releasing the slaves, they ran off to North Carolina with them and continued practicing slavery. Now, in North Carolina, they finished in 1864, while we in the Caribbean finished in 1834. It's about a 20 year difference. But we believe the first persons to have built the house were the Irish, the Scottish, and the English. They were the persons being set down here to work on the plantation. They were dying really, really fast. So what happened? They had to, they turned to the Africans. But when you think of it, we all had a hard life. We all, at some point in time, worked way too hard and were treated really bad. So what do you do today? You're gonna simply love, you're gonna live, you're gonna forget it, and you're gonna move on. Let me go and drink some rum. Let me go. <laughs> Okay, now here at St. Nicholas Abbey, as Angelique would have told you from the beginning, we made rum. Now we have a five, we have a twelve, and we have the eighteen. The five year rum. 12 and the 18, those are your sippers. You've already tasted your white rum, which is in your rum punch. The white rum, when it first comes off the distillery, it looks like this, it's white. What we do with it, we put the white rum into the oak barrels we brought in from Kentucky. They had bourbon in them before and they're also charred on the inside. So you get a nice oaky bourbon flavor and it also changes the color. 
So as it ages, it gets darker and darker and smoother and smoother. So that's the situation with these ones. The five, of course, will be darker than the, the 12 will be darker than the five. And of course, the 18, the creme de la creme, the one that I'm gonna put up high, show you and put right back here. That's the 18, that's the darkest of them all. You don't get a taste of that. I'm just letting you know up front. Okay? Well, our rum is actually a single barrel rum. What do I mean by a single barrel rum? I simply mean that I pull down a barrel and I fill your bottle up versus the blended rum. What are blended rums? Now here at St. Nicholas Abbey, we do the single barrel. All the other rums in Barbados are blended. The distiller gives you a quarter of the aged rum and then he put as much as eight younger rums on top of it. So that's the difference. Now we, as I said, are the only people in Barbados who does a single barrel rum. The difference is that our rum is very smooth, it's also high in quality, and when you take a glass and you swirl it around, you're sure to see the beautiful legs of the rum coming down. That's like a good quality one. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What I have poured here for you, your couple, I have a five and a 12, so you get to crisscross and taste both of them, okay? So here are some fives. So all the ladies step forward and take a five with your couple. Okay. Or take five. Yeah. Five, five, yeah. yeah. So all the ladies have a five?
And for those persons who haven't seen the movie, I'll let you go into the movie. The evidence, we're gonna go down the hill. Okay, so pop into the shop, see if there's anything there you like, and then we'll go there from there. And over here, you distill the waffles first, then you fill them up right here, and then you stamp out the leather right here. So this is pepper rum they're doing, along with the bottom of the rum. All the packaging of the bottles, all the packaging of the products is done right here at this table. But today it's rum. It's cloud here, five here, five here, five here, rum is going to happen. Okay, so let's go over and see the Thank you. Yeah, there you go. 